that's nice to see that it's actually up there. <laughs> so thank you so much for the introduction. So uh, I'm a software engineer, but I'm always looking at exploring different ways of improving what I do. I want what I do in my day-to-day -to, -day to be as optimized as I can. And so one thing that I was exploring is, why can't I optimize my thought flow the same way I really like to uh, implement and optimize my workflow? So these are just some tools to think about to add to your mental toolbox. And just like as developers, we don't all use the same terminal or editor, maybe these hacks might not work for you, but there's something to consider. As we walk through this talk, one thing I want you to keep in mind is you can improve yourself. No matter where you're at, you can get better and improve with practice and time. So let's meet four people who are encountering some different problems and struggles in their lives. Who we have here is Yvette. She's a software engineer. We have Dell, a product designer. Nick, a network engineer. And Peyton, a product manager. Let's figure out what's going on in Yvette's life. What's her struggle she's encountering? So what she's having happen to her is she just has these thoughts that keep on circling around and around. She just can't seem to actually find some concentration and focus. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I have been told I was not loud enough. I wasn't close enough to the mic. So now I really feel like a podcaster going on or something. <laughs> I'm not cool enough to be on the radio. So this is a podcast, I think. <laughs> uh, so also with the bed, she has a lot of feelings of being overwhelmed with worries and general chaos. Any parents around here have a kid? Yeah, that's just your life. So you got to deal with that. <laughs> But, uh, and it, with her, that when something wrong happens, it seems to be directly happening just to her. So what's one thing that we can look at to help out a bit? Uh, let's try and explore mindfulness. So what is mindfulness? Mindfulness is the awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. This is a quote from John Kabat-Zen. And he's a professor and a teacher at uh, the Massachusetts Medical School. And he adapted Buddhist teachings uh, on mindfulness and developed this stress reduction and relaxation program here. And so let's try breaking down that definition into something maybe we can explain, understand a little bit better. So mindfulness is the uh, mental habit of paying attention without thinking. How we can kind of relate this to us as uh, software engineers and developers and in our technology uh, circles, think of it as logging for your brain. The more you know about yourself and your emotions, the more likely you're gonna be aware of when you even have a problem or what is going on with yourself. So I try to give you a definition on this, but sometimes it's easier to actually do it than to just talk about it. Uh, quick show of hands, has anybody done mindfulness meditation before or has mindfulness practice? Awesome, that is so great to hear. So this will just be your quick uh, practice for the day. But for those of you guys who haven't done it before, hopefully I'll give you a little bit of clarity into what mindfulness is. So if you guys feel comfortable, what I want you to do is put the phones down, close the laptops, sit up in our chairs, and if you're comfortable, can you close your eyes? What we're gonna do is what's considered a quick body scan. <sighs> so with our eyes closed, what I want you to do is not try too hard, which will create tension, but just accept what is happening with your body and focus on my voice. Allow things to be as you feel them. Allow yourself to be exactly as you are. Be aware of what you feel, and remember, there is no right way to do this. Breathe in and out. Starting with your feet on the ground, feel the weight of them. Feel what you feel below, traveling up your calf 
to your knees and your thighs. What do you feel there? Is there anything to observe? Moving up your chest, through your shoulders and your neck, out through your head. Blink your eyes gently open, and that was just a little moment of mindfulness there. So how do we actually practice this and add this into our daily lives? Well, first off, find uh, something to focus on. Whether it's your breath, whether it's your body, just find something that works for you for your focus. And then the next thing, which is the hard part, is keep that focus, but don't judge yourself. It's surprisingly hard to do that pay attention without thinking something because your consciousness is always gonna wanna try to hijack that. And that striving too hard, like you can't just sit down and be like, I am gonna meditate. You, you kind of have to let it sneak up on you uh, to actually get the benefit out of it. And this uh, moving, uh, focusing on something, finding your uh, uh, focus, maybe uh, lose it a little bit, and then exerting that control back over it is the secret sauce to your mindfulness practice. In order to do this, are you gonna need a whole bunch of props? You're gonna need some mad gong going on, a little bit of crystals, a sweet ass cushion? No, <laughs> that, there's no perfect way to meditate. <laughs> um, it does help when you are uh, in, incorporated in a formal practice to maybe have a certain time and place that you associate with that meditation, but you really don't need anything besides yourself in order to meditate. Uh, so you can have a formal practice where you have a certain time and you are going to be doing your mindfulness, or you can kind of do a more informal practice. So you bring mindfulness and mindful awareness to activities that you're doing. So think about it, while you're brushing your teeth, just brush your teeth. When you get into your car, focus on how the wheel feels below you. Focus on the other cars on the road. Think about how much and how awesome the world would be if everybody brought a little bit of intention to their morning driving. Because I know that would be pretty awesome. <laughs> And so then there's lots of apps you can use for this too. You don't have to just do it on your own. Uh, there's Calm, there's uh, Headspace, there's lots of different guided meditations that can help you out with your practice. And one thing that I've had a question about is, do you have to actually do mindfulness meditation in order to be mindful? The answer is kind of yes and no. You can play a game of basketball without practicing basketball, but it does help to do that practice. So think of it as your mindful awareness as your uh, aspirational end goal, while your practice is what works you to get there. So what can mindfulness actually help us with? So it can help out with some emotional balance. So give us some calm and centering and perspective on our emotions. It can help out with response flexibility. So it can help exert a little bit of control when uh, you have uh, something happen to you before you give that response. So something that makes you truly angry or upset, you know, you can kind of help give a little bit of redirection before you give that response. It can also help out with the down regulation of fear. So mindfulness meditation actually enhances the prefrontal cortex, which this is associated with your higher order brain functions, like problem solving, concentration, decision making. And uh, it helps downregulate that amygdala activity that's associated with your flight or flight responses. But wait, there's more it can also help out with too. So it can give you a little bit of insight into yourself, knowing your own body and knowing your own thought processes better. It can help out with empathy. So practicing a mindfulness actually helps uh, activate different mind regions that underlying empathy and helps increase mindful awareness. It can also help out with morality. So if people perceive their thoughts as being impermanent and kind of more floating states of mind, they're less likely to get caught up in them and it helps them become more broadly aware of the situation and that present moment. And it can also help out with your own intuition. Your gut instinct is more likely to be heard when you're self-aware. 
and that connection between your amygdala, that fight or flight, and the rest of your brain actually gets a little bit weaker while your connection between your prefrontal cortex and the rest of your brain gets a little bit stronger. So it just helps out with those uh, different brain functions. So how will this tie back and actually help a vet with her problems she was seeing? So she had those thoughts that just kept on circling around and around in her head. This helps her maybe be aware of them and help her redirect those a little bit, interrupt that uh, circular cycle that was going on. She was feeling overwhelmed with worries and a lot of general chaos in her life. And this just helps downregulate down some of those fears and help with uh, that chaos. Also, everything wrong, and it was happening just to her, maybe she can find a little bit of insight and perspective with this and realize not everything is going wrong right now. So next, with Dell, what is their struggle going on here? Well, right now they have a resolution list a mile long and nothing uh, seems to actually get uh, checked off of it and it doesn't really last past January 2nd. They start and stop trying to tackle all these really big things like healthy eating, exercising, and procrastination, but that's just it. They start and stop them all the time. They have lots of to-do lists, but not so many uh, check marks going on there. So an idea to help Dell? Well, we're gonna look at habit building. This is a quote from Will Durant, which is often attributed wrongly to Aristotle. But what it is, is we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is then not an act, but a habit. So I really like this quote because it shows how important habits are and how really pervasive they are in our lives. So let's break it down. What is a habit? It's not just something that you do every day, but it's something that's a frequently reoccurring behavior that is triggered when a certain cue is encountered. And then that behavior is actually performed automatically. So when you find yourself in a specific situation, you'll find yourself doing something automatically. So let's look at this when we tie it all together. So when a cue is encountered, you go through and do your routine. In this case, there is a reward at the end of this and uh, it will cycle through to create the habit and the habit loop, which will ha then trigger your neural pathways that, are, uh, that go on when you have those mental associations. So you might be saying to yourself, I don't think I have any habits like this, but you'd be wrong because we all of our lives are uh, completely infiltrated with different habits. And so I'm gonna look at some example ones, so then maybe I'll trigger it that you can see, hey, yeah, I am doing this in my life. So think about when you wake up, what is the first thing you do? For a lot of people, they might reach over and uh, go to the uh, restroom and brush their teeth. So that is an example of a trigger and then the habit activity associated with it. Uh, as soon as you get to work, you sit down, you stand up, you check your Slack, you check your email. That is an association with your a habit. When you get stressed, you find yourself reaching for the Cheetos or the chocolate or Cheetos and chocolate, whatever it floats your boat. You know, those are the triggers and habits that kind of go together. So we kind of learn about what are habits, but how can we do this on purpose for stuff we want to add into our lives? Well, first off, you need to identify your goal. So this is gonna tell you what kind of system to create. You don't wanna just kind of be doing a random set of actions every day. You need to make sure this is something that's actually uh, advancing you towards your end goal. You wanna uh, identify or create environmental triggers. So just like what we were looking at with the example habits, these are your starting point for what is gonna automatically uh, make you do that behavior. So such as the flossing your teeth. Uh, for me, one thing I looked for when I was uh, implementing a new habit is uh, as soon as I look at my laundry hamper, I cannot put stuff on it 
because I always would find myself having a mountain to close. And that was what I wanted to prevent. And so when I take off my clothes and I look at my laundry hamper, I have to do something. I'm not allowed to put them on top for the clothing mountain. And my end goal with that was I needed more time because I had just had a kid and I had no time. And so uh, I made sure my end goal was big and I saw what was my trigger was looking at my clothing hamper. And then next you need to define your reward. This is gonna be something that's a small related uh, prize that you kind of get a quick boost for uh, doing immediately after the habit. So this helps really develop those neural pathways and uh, allow you to really set in that trigger and the habits. So the reward's not the prize. It's something that actually enhances the habit. So think about for me with uh, my clothing, it was seen that not everything was around and I was able to kind of gain back some time. Another thing you might think of is while you're working out, do you ever play music you really like? That is a reward in itself that helps enhance that habit. So since your trigger is gonna be your big cue for uh, what kicks off your habit, let's identify some triggers that you can actually use in your own lives. So you wanna look for something that is kind of already in your routine. You can create something from scratch, but that's just gonna make it that much harder to get that entire loop into your uh, brain and the neural pathways. So and some examples, think about when you shower. Is there anything that you could tack on there that you wanna add as a habit to enhance your life? Eating breakfast. Maybe you wanna add in some writing time. As soon as you sit down, you eat breakfast, you make sure your notepad's right next to you. Commuting. This is a wonderful one that I uh, am working on in a habit here is I sit down in my car and I sit up straight. I work on my posture. Think about different triggers that uh, could help you set up for your own habit building. So then what does it look like when we're trying to work on a positive, positive habit loop here? Well, you think about your cue. For this, the example will be I wake up in the morning. I sit up in my bed. I put my feet down, oh, there are my workout shoes, right where my feet are at. I attempt to add in uh, my body weight exercises. I get some push-ups in, I do some pull-ups, I get some squats. My reward, I let myself listen to something I really like. Uh, I try not to listen to food fighters anytime, but except when I work out, because then when I'm working out, I finally get to rock out to food fighters. Think about what works for you. <laughs> Unfortunately, this habit loop can actually be uh, triggered as a negative feedback loop too. So think about, hey, I want to add some exercise in my life. I hear jogging's awesome. I should probably do that. But if you don't like jogging, here's what that loop's going to look like. I'm going to make myself wake up early, which I hate, and then I'm going to have to jog, which I hate. Uh, even before I get into that uh, activity, I'm thinking, this is going to suck. I'm going to hate it. When is it over? And then uh, my, I don't have very much reward to do that. My reward is actually not jogging. So not doing the activity is better for me than actually doing that loop. So you got to be on the lookout for if you're trying to set yourself up to be successful, look out for if you're actually setting yourself up for a negative feedback loop going on there. If you can't tell, I don't like running. So. That is not something I've tried to implement. <laughs> so some tips for actually making your habits stick. Well, find out something that you like about the habit. So if your end goal is to uh, exercise more, think about, you know, I want a better life quality. I want to be able to keep up with my kids. So if you don't like jogging, don't jog. Do something else. Do yoga. Do body weight exercises. Do some payo. You know, whatever works for you. Um, have somebody else to do the habit with. So the jogging. Maybe you do like jogging. Maybe there's a couple of you guys around here. Do it with somebody else. You know, give it a, a go. Maybe you're trying to do writing. Write with somebody else. Or maybe have an online accountability buddy. Somebody uh, doing it with somebody else makes it more pleasurable. Have a way of keeping a uh, score. So give yourself that check mark. Give yourself that star. 
do a little humble brag on Twitter. You know, whatever way you can kind of let yourself know that you did a good job and you completed your habit successfully. And then make it kind of hard not to do the habit. So tell everybody you know, hey, I'm gonna eat keto this week, or I'm gonna start reading one book a week. And if you don't do the habit, it's kind of hard not to do it because people are like, hey, hey, I see you're not eating keto, is that bread? So uh, make it a little bit hard to not actually stick with your habit. And then with your habit, uh, treat it like a retrospective. Uh, who here does agile development? I'm assuming a lot of people, hopefully, yeah. So with your retrospective, it's all about thinking what worked well, what didn't work well, and what can we do different? Same thing with your habit. At the end of a week or two, think about what you're trying to implement and say, hey, did this work for me? Is this working towards my goal? Or maybe I need to try something different. So how will this actually help Dell? Well, they had that resolution list that was a mile long. Hopefully, they'll be able to start marking that off one at a time. They kept on trying to start and uh, stop tackling all those big stuff. And Hopefully they'll look at starting small and building up to those big stuff will actually uh, set you up for a better, uh, more complete uh, habit building experience. They had lots of to-do lists and hopefully they'll uh, be able to look at those and see, hey, is this actually working towards my end goal? And if not, maybe they just need to let those go. So next we have Nick, he's a network engineer. Right now it seems like he's having some problems avoiding some challenges. So he's not doing the stretch work and he kind of wants to look smart, but he's really worried if that he does something hard, it's gonna show that he actually isn't smart. He seems to really give up easily. You know, he doesn't persevere through the hard stuff and he's not really giving it his all. He also seems to be kind of threatened by the success in others. When he sees other people getting those promotions and other people getting those pats on the back, he really thinks it should have been his. So a solution that we can look at for Nick is growth mindset. So this is the idea that abilities can be developed and they're not set. And it's how conscious and unconscious thoughts affect us and how something as simple as wording can actually have an impact on our ability to improve. So this idea came from Carol S. Dweck, and she's a psychologist and uh, wrote this book that's called Mindset, The New Psychology of Success. And what this explores is how there's a power in our most basic beliefs and how they affect what we want and if we achieve at getting it. And it also explores how what you are dealt with in life is just a starting point for more development. So how I'm tying this back to us as uh, in the technology circle, developers, engineers, think of yourself as vanilla software. That's just a starting point. You can always have more add-ons and frameworks. So let's look through and how this kind of uh, grows on each other. So the belief, I can or I can't, leads to action, which is the practice, which leads to growth. So if you don't have that belief, are you gonna practice? If you don't have the action, are you gonna get better? And growth mindset is about putting that into practice. Action is the key to the growth, but belief is really the fuel. So some questions to kind of challenge why with this. Why hide your deficiencies instead of overcoming them? Why look for friends or partners who will just shore up the self-esteem instead of looking for ones that challenge you to grow? Why seek out the tried and true instead of experiences that will really stretch you? And these ideas about risk and effort, they all come from our mindset. So these are some example thoughts on the different mindset with a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. 
And no one is really 100% one or the other. You might find yourself in certain situations having a more growth mindset or having a more fixed mindset, especially if you're, like, you're getting a lot of feedback at you. You might start getting defensive and then fall into a fixed mindset type. Um, it just depends on uh, with this, and it's something that you can work and improve at. So here are some thoughts in a fixed mindset and then a growth mindset. I suck at math versus math has been challenging for me. I'll never be an artist versus I feel dissatisfied with all the art I've done up to now. I'm not good at handstands versus I haven't learned how to do handstands yet. I put the handstand one in there because that's what I'm working on. I would totally show you my progress, but I got the dress on today. <laughs> it's getting there. <laughs> so with these, they are small changes between uh, those sentences, but those small changes make a big difference. So how do we actually put growth mindset into, pra uh, into practice? So first, accept you're not perfect but you can improve. So you can be more athletic. You can have better handwriting. You can be more knowledgeable. You can be a better coder. You have to push to try, even if you're afraid, if afraid to fail. Hiding your weakness means you can't overcome them. Change your perspective on what failure and criticism are. They don't have anything to your future or your worth. If you failed at something, see it as room for growth, for improvement. It's not bad, it's just feedback that you can improve. And don't focus on the end result, focus on the process. So goals are good, but with too much emphasis, you're not gonna enjoy the learning and the participation that comes with the, uh, getting to the end result. And remember, learning fast is not the same as learning well. Don't compare yourself with others. You will be learning at your own speed, and you want to be learning it well, not fast. And if you find yourself discouraged, always add a yet on the end of when you're talking with yourself. I'm just not good at this yet. So imposter syndrome. This is something that we're hearing a little bit more about, but it's not something new. It actually was uh, from a study in the 70s with high-functioning academic women, and it was, uh, it's actually a psychological term that refers to a pattern of behavior when people really doubt their accomplishments, and they have this persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. So we might see this with early career devs or maybe people who are coming to our technology space from other uh, different uh, environments. So you can kind of think of it just as a different mindset. And just like a fixed mindset, it can help a lot if you focus on growth. So it may seem to you that everybody knows everything at your company and they know so, so much more than you. But a lot of that is just experience and practice and you don't have that yet. So how is this going to help out Nick? Well, he was avoiding the ch those challenges. Hopefully, he'll look at embracing those challenges for the learning opportunities that they are. He was giving up pretty easily before. And hopefully, he'll see through that perseverance and struggle and uh, feedback that that's how you really learn and grow. He kept on feeling a little threatened by the success of others. And hopefully he'll see that other people's success doesn't have any impact on his own success, that you can find lessons and inspirations in others. So lastly, we had Peyton. She is our product manager. And what is she having a couple of difficulties with right now? Well, she has a really long reading list in no time. Sound like anybody? I know mine is like in the hundreds right now. <laughs> uh, she has a huge backlog of articles. Her Slack feed looks like it's all read. She hasn't read anything. And she just has so many different articles that she needs to read. 
She also really wants to try to stay current in uh, what's going on in technology and business right now. So something that we can look at for Peyton is to let us explore speed reading and see if this might be a solution for her. So reading. We don't think about this all the time because we just do it, but it's actually a three-step process. So first, you fixate on a word. Second, it's a saccade, which I Googled that to make sure I pronounced it right, saccade. And so that's the actual movement of the eye going to, uh, over to encompass the entire word. And third is the process. Think about it. That's your brain actually figuring out what you just saw and read. And so here is a cooler look at the, what I just said. So fixation. I can't go too far away from the old mic. And then the saccade moving over. And then there's a couple other uh, things. And, but the thing is, is with your eye, it might not actually be going that straight away. Sometimes you may take in something a couple times before you actually get it. And your eye movement doesn't always just go straight ahead. So let's explore what are some speed reading techniques that might be able to help with this. So first off is skimming. So this is something that we probably already do. You gl glance through a text, find the important parts to read. Uh, the thing is, is, it's not associated with a very high memory retention. You get a good idea about what is in the text and the materials, kind of what to look for. Next, you have metaguiding. So if you've ever seen those uh, things that talk about using your finger or using a pen and following along with your eye, that's metaguiding. So this is kind of an older technique that you use a prop to make your gaze go faster and it helps you focus on certain words. So lastly, there is a kind of the newer technique, which is called Rapid Serial Visual Presentation, or RSVP. So this is where single words are gonna flash on the screen, and so you're concentrating on just one word at a time. And what I want you to tie it back to is, think about this as increasing your throughput. If you can get through more books and more material, that will help your throughput. So RSVP is a little bit hard to explain. So let's see what it actually looks like. This is an example from a app that's called Spitz and uh, or Spritz. And uh, this is something that you can actually have on your phone, in your browser. There's a couple different extensions to work on as RSVP. And like, if you look at it at first, it's hard, and then eventually it gets easier. The problem is, is I find if I try to read long articles with this, um, my mental capacity just starts to uh, go to hell because I can't keep track of anything because my mind's just trying to keep up with the words. So some people love this, some people it's not their favorite thing. But a note of caution. Sometimes <laughs> when you have speed, and comprehension, they might be a trade-off. So you notice with that spritz example, you got all the stuff. Do you remember what you just read? I bet you don't. I, I have tried doing that example sometimes. I can't even tell you what it actually says. <laughs> so with keeping that in mind, the techniques I'm gonna propose for them to implement is actually to do smarter reading type, not just speed reading. So these are some uh, suggested techniques uh, to help you level up a bit. And those small gains over time can really help you with bigger gains later. And so these ideas kind of come from Scott H. Young and uh, with uh, some other ideas from Brian Dunning. And so what this is is uh, considered a better reading technique. So first off, skim before you read, which Skimming is reading, but it's not the same. You're gonna get a, get a mental picture of what is going on in the article or the book, and then you can actually figure out what you're gonna be going for. To improve your fluency. So say you're working on a book that's a brand new technology, and every other word you're coming into a new concept, you're coming into a new acronym, you're not gonna be reading that fast. So if you uh, get an idea about what is are those common vocabulary and you improve that fluency, you will be able to read faster. Know what you want before you read it. 
So anytime we see an article, we kind of I have an idea about what we want to get out of it. So if I'm reading a new technical book on Ruby, I will, might be looking for a certain pattern, or I have a certain solution that I want to try to look for a thing on, like Stack or Overflow. I know what I'm looking for, and I can skim it before I actually have to read everything. And if you're really reading for retention, think about the text after you read it. So if I'm going through my new Ruby patterns and I'm trying to read Pooter, uh, that's project, or Pooter is uh, the object-oriented uh, patterns from Sandy Metz, I might read through that uh, pattern, stop, really think about it, maybe try to tie it into some code I actually knew before I go on. So how will this help out Peyton, our product manager? Well, she had that longer reading list. Hopefully with those small uh, reading gains and her in, uh, increase in fluency over time, she'll be able to cut that list. She had that backlog of emails and articles to read. Hopefully she'll be able to uh, apply some techniques to skim the ones that she doesn't really need to retain and really examine the ones that uh, she needs to know and uh, really get something out of. And she wanted to stay current in tech uh, articles and uh, business articles. And hopefully that will be th a thing of the past for her. So with all the people we had here, we were able to explore some mindfulness with a vet and help her get a little bit of insight and perspective. With Dell, we did some habit building and hopefully has some fresh beneficial habits going on there. Nick had uh, a little bit of uh, problems with uh, looking at his success and how to grow and hopefully with a new mindset and beliefs and improving himself he will be able to get that practice and effort and growth he wanted to see. Lastly we had Peyton with a uh, speed reading and hopefully those new techniques will help her improve her speed. But with all of this we explored four different people going on there but what if you implement some of those uh, techniques just in yourself? It's amazing how these actually will grow and build on each other. So with habit building, it'll help you uh, actually build and work towards a regular mindful practice. With mindfulness, you can be better aware of your thoughts and your processes, so then you can understand if you are kind of in a fixed or a growth mindset. With speed reading, this helps you tackle your material in order to help grow and learn. And then with growth mindset, you understand that setting up regular habits can help you improve towards your goals. So that's all I have. What questions do you guys have? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm curious if you've looked into different hacks on, I don't know, communication frameworks, how to deal with people that think differently and communicate differently mm. about things. Is that general problem? Uh, I haven't looked into uh, communication as much. Uh, in my, is this still on? Okay, good. Uh, in my personal life, I definitely have uh, done uh, communication stuff with my husband, such as figuring out your love languages. Has everybody done the love languages one? Yeah, so you figure out how you can com communicate with your loved one by showing what actually shows your love. Um, that doesn't work so much for your coworkers, unless you really love your coworkers, I guess. <laughs> um, I just have a lot of experience from being in the workplace, and I, I kind of like to do the uh, figure out what works for me and then uh, improve on it with your coworkers. So I kind of had uh, some miscommunications going on with a coworker because I prefer all my communication in person, and he hated being interrupted, absolutely hated it, and wanted everything to be over Slack. And so we kind of had to work together on what communication worked for our relationship. So. I don't have any great books for you, but it's something that I should probably look into. Thank you. <laughs> so going back to the growth mindset, mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier, I think you said you had kids. I do as well. Uh, what do you have any advice, or have you done any research? 
research into how to help our kids, especially going through an education system that actually pushes them towards a fixed mindset, mm. how to fight off that in a growth mindset? Oh, yeah, I definitely have explored this. So I have a four-year-old. Uh, it's not quite uh, school age yet, but um, one thing that I've been finding myself trying to do is you don't praise the ability, you praise the effort. So I never tell my daughter she's smart. You want to because you know they are smart. But what you want to do is you praise. I see how much you have been uh, working at this. I see how much uh, you've been practicing your dance. I see what you're doing that looks like you're really trying to improve and you just kind of keep on focusing on that effort. I'm, I don't know how this would work in, you know, with the school system, but I think if you just keep it in the forefront in your, uh, in your personal life and in all of your interactions with your child, I think that really can have, have a good benefit there. I think it's definitely something that maybe it's more up to your direct management to really see with you. Uh, if they don't have one-on-ones, do you, do you have one-on-ones with your manager? I think one-on-ones are great. That's uh, where you and your manager can really see where you're at and give that better feedback. Because uh, with uh, improving and getting that growth, you need practice, but you also need uh, good feedback going on there. Um, I think it kind of would be up to that manager to help you see that if you're being really defensive when you are given criticism or to let you know, hey, you haven't really been trying to take some of that stretch work. Maybe we need to work towards that next sprint. Um, but I think it's also our own responsibility to see if we are self-limiting ourselves with our beliefs. It would be great if you know, a lot of uh, companies looked at how to implement that at a more enterprise level, but I'm not sure if I've seen that that much. <laughs> I think everybody's ready for lunch. Everybody hungry? <laughs>